gentlemen, everyone around and in between, it is Debate Sensei and PDA edition. This is where we talk about things relevant to the National Parliamentary Debate Association, a competitive debate. Uh, and I have with me a, a recent competitor, current coach at UCSD, Gabe Gravel. Thank you, Gabe. Good to see you. And it's SDSU, not UCSD. Did I say USCSD? I always like my my brain always switches that. I don't know what it is. I don't even hear myself say it. So no SDSU. problem. Yeah, I get it. I, I I know the difference between those two um, university systems. I went to I went to Cal State Long Beach, so I know very well the difference between that. I just for some reason it's it's a little, a little bit of dyslexia. I think. All right. So. What we're going to be talking about this week is a uh, tournament recap from just last weekend's tournament at Rice University, known as the Rice University Classic Tournament. Um, let's start with what is the significance or symbolism of this tournament in the season? Uh, yeah, so Rice is a pretty big uh, season opener. Um, when I was competing in person before the pandemic, it wasn't as prominent, but with the advent of online debate, it kind of became the de facto first tournament that a lot of nationally competitive teams went to. Um, this year, it's significant because uh, it has quite a few entries and quite a few entries from schools that are nationally competitive. Mm. Um, in 2022, there were only 15 entries. This year, we saw 24 entries, which is a okay. great increase. Uh, and it's sort of following the trend of um, as we get further into online or in-person tournaments again, we start to see a gradual increase in the interest in some of these tournaments. Um, there were a lot of schools there. UT Tyler was there. Rice obviously was there. Berkeley, Whitman, and even a team from Mercer, which is our most east eastern school out in oh, Georgia. They brought it to Georgia. Team. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I just was doing an episode for CETA, and they have uh, another school, Emory, out of there with a, but theirs is in CETA. Uh, so it's uh, interesting to see where all these different schools come from. So, okay, um, it, are there any divisions, or is it all one division? Novice open. Uh yeah, um, so they didn't have divisions at this tournament. I believe that they just didn't have enough teams to Got make it. a novice division. Mm -hmm. That's relatively common at tournaments like this that are more focused on having NPDA at a national level. Um, if you're willing to travel from California or Walla Walla, Washington to Houston, uh, right. you're more likely going to be in the open division is a general rule. Okay. Um, I'm looking at some of the entries. It looks like um, obviously Rice comes with the biggest entry. It's the easiest for them to bring somebody. Um, but we got McKendry. Tell me about that team. Or that oh, yeah. So uh, McKendry, I know all of the coaches on the McKendry squad. They're wonderful people. We debated McKendry quite a bit. Uh, they sort of had a down year last year, but mm. they're, uh, I believe he's their DOF. Joe Blasdell is. Uh, does work with, on the NPDA board and runs the NPDA tournament still. So they were still present and they did bring a team to NPDA last year. Um, it just looks like administratively the people there want to do NPDA, at least some of the coaches that I know. Um, but it seems that they're kind of being pulled between a couple different events. Um, I talked a lot with their main coach, Brent, last year at NPDA, and he obviously loves NPDA as a format. So it's great that they were able to make it down. Um, they're located in Lebanon, Illinois, which is mm. about an hour away from St. Louis. Uh, so it's not local for them, but it's more local for them than, say, Golden Gate Invitational. Okay. Um, who would you say is the their, their leading team? Or would you say? Um, I'm yeah, I'm really not sure. Last year, okay. they only brought one team um, right. to NPDA, and it was people who'd been doing, I believe, NFALD all year. They were just more so trying it out. Um, okay. Not cool. sure who's carried over and how their teams are this year. All right. Um, 
So let's talk then. You've got 24 entries, one division. What were the break likes? Who was the big, uh, who did anyone break multiple teams? Uh, yeah, so four schools ended up breaking teams. Um, okay. UT Tyler, Whitman, and Berkeley all broke two teams. And then Rice was able to break, I believe, all of their entries, uh, oh. breaking six teams. What? Unless there's another Rice entry hiding here. But it was really an impressive showing from Rice being able to break all six of their uh, entries. Whoa. And they filled up quite a bit of the bracket. Half of the bracket was Rice teams. Okay. Half the bracket was Rice teams. Okay. So how does the uh, the system work? I'm looking and it says there's five rounds. Yeah, so um, the way that it works in NPDA uh, is that they do breaks based on having a positive win-loss record. So if there's five prelims like there was at Rice, uh, that means you have to get 3-2, win three rounds, lose no more than two rounds to break. Um, if there's six rounds, for example, you have to win four. Uh, some tournaments might break three threes, but typically if you win four, you know for sure that you're breaking. Right. And because of this... You don't always know how many teams are going to break at every tournament because it could be a different number based on how prelims go. Okay. So they had 12 teams that had more that had three or more wins, uh, which caused them to do a partial octos round. Oh, okay. uh, and this partial octos round is actually pretty. It's a it's a bit of a headache to look at on the tab room mm, uh, because um, they had so how partials round works is that they'll have the bottom of the bracket debate each other as if it's an octos round. And then the top in this example, four teams will buy through this round and just go straight to the quarterfinals mm -hmm. because rice had so many teams and all of their teams were towards the bottom half of the bracket. Mm -hmm. uh, they were in every single uh, round, meaning only two rounds actually happened and rice had to have two walkover rounds. Okay. Um, a walkover round is when two teams from the same school hit each other and the team just decides to who they would like to advance. Um, there are some different team policies and politics on this. Typical perspective is that you don't have your debaters debate each other. Mm -hmm. You just decide based on seniority or who needs more MPT points or whatever. I'm not sure what Rice decided, but I believe they're they are also a team that doesn't have their debaters debate each other. So they had two rounds that were just walkover rounds and two round, other rounds in the partial. Right. Okay. And so, and both of those, the both of the partial ox, they both won, huh? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at that. All right. So when we get to quarters, Rice is in every single round. Yeah. My they goodness. Are. Oh, wow. Um, that's pretty amazing. So um, uh, now at some tournaments, uh, I, I, I know they didn't post the, the sweepstakes here, but at some tournaments, the um, the hosting school doesn't get sweepstakes. But if, if they did, it looks like Rice is walking away with this tournament overall, no matter how they do from here. Yeah, it's, it'd be pretty hard for anyone else to possibly get more sweeps than them. Okay, but Rice only picks up one of those four? Uh, yeah, I believe that okay. is the case. Uh, three out of four of the Rice teams dropped. Um, the Berkeley team that was in the quarters round is actually the Berkeley team that won the NPT last year. Ah. They picked up uh, on the AF along with Whitman ML. Um, they also picked up on the AF. Rice SN was the only team to advance from the Rice teams. And then a second Whitman team, Whitman GM, also advanced on the neg. Okay. And then uh, now we have now we have semis where we got Whitman in both rounds versus Rice and Berkeley in the semis, yep. right? Okay. And that's where – and then Whitman picks up both of those rounds and they close out. They do. Uh, so – this is a little bit of a repeat of the previous day for – oh, no, sorry. I'm misreading this. Um, yeah, so Whitman is on both sides. They end up being neg in both rounds, which uh, is 
I'm not sure how the strikes or the flips went, um, but that is a pretty big advantage uh, when you're prepping to have both your teams on the same side. It right. makes it a lot easier to prep. Obviously, they're prepping against two different teams. Uh, Berkeley reads things that are much different than what Rice reads, and they do have to bifurcate, bifurcate their prep a little bit there, um, but they are able to pick it up. The topic for the semifinal round was uh, the African Union should adopt a policy to increase financial literacy. Huh. I do not know what happened in the Rice SN versus Whitman ML round. Okay. Uh, but I do know what happened in the Berkeley versus Whitman round. Berkeley, being on the AF, uh, did not like this topic, which I think makes sense. Um, typically, at a national level at least, uh, any sort of international union actor is typically difficult to debate because there is limited solvency for large big stick impacts. Uh, further adopting a policy always makes it difficult to um, have specific stable ground. Uh, it essentially makes the topic, it forces the topic to be somewhat effects topical. Um, right. It's not effects topical because it says that you're supposed to adopt the policy. So technically by the wording of the topic, it is an effects topicality, but it functions in a similar way because you're forcing the AF to choose, right? The only topical affirmatives under this topic force the AF to Incre result in the increase in financial literacy, right? Yeah. They don't have to pass a policy. Okay, cool. They don't have to pass, they technically do not have to pass a policy that only increases financial literacy. Right. Uh, there can be a bunch of other impacts generated from a policy. Then you get into a sort of difference, sort of T debate. Um, but in general, it's not a super favorable topic for the AF, I think, or the NEG. Um, it's also not super clear what financial literacy means in this context. Does financial literacy mean financial literacy for just people in Africa, for government officials in Africa, for mm. the members of the AU, I think is also a legitimate reading of this topic that they only have to increase financial literacy for people who are working in the AU. Right. I think all these sort of problems with the topic generally are what caused Berkeley to say, we don't want to deal with that. We don't want to get into some messy procedural debate. Let's just reject the topic. Like wouldn't Berkeley on the affirmative be able to use that uh, since they are on the affirmative, couldn't they add that context, Couldn't they provide that context um, and, and help make sense of the resolution. Um, yeah, yeah, I think how people respond to that argument, I guess, is what I'm saying. Which argument specifically? The, the, the argument that it's like, well, you're the 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 critique is that there's not enough context. It could mean a whole lot of different things. There's a whole lot of avenues to go down. It's like, well, you on the affirmative have like not just the ability to but sort of the privilege of adding that context and and sort of defining those terms why would that put the affirmative at a disadvantage um i'm not really i'm not saying those things to say that the affirmative is, is at a disadvantage in this topic right. okay um, fair enough i think you can go either way uh i think that those issues make it it disincentivizes defending this topic mm. um because there might be something that really just sneaks up on you. Uh, okay. I know that Berkeley wants to win this round. Uh, they won the last two tournaments that they've participated in, which were both national tournaments last year. Um, this is their first tournament of the year. They want to knock this one out of the park. Mm. And I think there being some sort of oversight and topic wording that sneaks up on them, disincentivizes them from defending this topic. Okay. Um, the you can at, on the AF make the argument that this mandates some level of effects topicality on the framework debate, um, but that would sort of shield against any sort of uh, 
in round abuse from rejecting this topic where you would say if we defended this topic it would have been busted for us anyway which would have been worse for the negative because we could leverage a million different policies that only partially resulted in financial literacy okay so if they're rejecting the topic what is the advocacy from the affirmative in this round i don't know the specific advocacy text i do know that it is a uh, Marxism adjacent position that okay. uh, is heavily inspired by uh, the writings of Silvia Federici. Hmm. Um, and I believe the alternative has something to do with embracing a, the occult. <laughs> embracing the occult? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Man, is there any more like way you could outline that? Do you know any more about what this alternative is? Um... You're sort of testing my memory yeah. of Federici, oh, okay. but I believe that it understands the uh, position of women during the witch hunts and the mm. oh, reign okay. of terror that was enacted against women during the like Salem witch trials and all that okay. as a sort of like policing force to maintain gender roles and maintain the uh, devaluation of domestic labor within the household in order to like propagate gendered norms and maintain like the reproduction of life for the workers without the compensation of the capitalists, okay. right? So therefore embracing the occult is rejecting, and this is where I'm estimating. I believe it's something to do with they are rejecting uh, the like material suppression of women and trying to overcome the gendered hierarchy endemic to capitalism. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. One second. All right. Um, so you don't know what happened in the other semifinal round, but the result is both Whitman teams go forward. Oh, yeah. So the question now is, how did Whitman in the Berkeley round respond to that? It, 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 any details? Yeah. So um, Whitman did read framework, as you normally do against someone who's rejecting the topic. Uh, and they did also read a uh, another procedural that asked Berkeley to specify which branch of occultism they embraced and defended. Um, this is, I think, a very clever argument. Um, I think every team that rejects the topic should be able to answer some sort of specific spec question. And it's started to kind of become more popular to read pointed procedurals about critical affirmatives. Mm. Uh, again, I have to estimate what the argument is, but I believe the argument is something along the lines of there's a lot of different types of occultism. Uh, you could argue that satanic panic rock bands like KISS are occultism. You could argue that uh, other sorts of more specific witchcraft practices are also occultism. If you don't specify which type you're embracing, it's impossible for the negative to answer it specifically, right? Because you could stand up in the next speech and say, we weren't talking about that occultism. We were talking about this occultism. Right. Because uh, my mind automatically went to like World War II fascist countries. They seem to be way into occultism. I wouldn't put that on somebody. Um, and I don't like making those analogies in general. They seem like uh, uh, those are fairly weak analogies that people tap into way too often. But at the same time, I, I couldn't help my mind from going that direction, just hearing the, the alternative. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's a legitimate instance of occultism. And it's also one of the more popular in literature and popular culture. Uh, yeah. Instances. Yeah. Uh, and if, if there's anything you don't want to do is uh, dr start drawing associations either unintentionally or not with fascist governments. Um, so, uh, okay. What were, how about some other 
were there any other interesting uh, topics that came out? You're saying that that wasn't necessarily a, a favorite topic, but throughout the tournament, were there, there some other topics that people may have been more favorable to? Uh, I did hear about this topic. I don't know the specific wording. It was a value topic, uh, but it was mm. something along the lines of student success should be prioritized over research in higher education. Oh, wow. Okay. I thought that was an interesting topic. It tried to sort of place what higher education institutions are for. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is sort of a uh, layering question there, mm -hmm. right? If what is ostensibly the point of research at large research institutions, they bring in money to the university, they build up their reputation in the university are universities able to provide good education without things like a reputation or funding from research grants, et cetera. Mm. I think on the flip side, um, anyone who's gone to a large university that does a lot of research will notice that they have large class sizes uh, taught by graduate students who uh, might not be as engaged in the subject or unable to be engaging with the subject due to mm. how large their classes. Um, I certainly in undergrad had a lot of classes where you could tell the professor was probably a great researcher, but they were a terrible lecturer. Right, right. And how that affects learning outcomes, how that affects education in general, I think is very interesting. Very cool. Um, it also seems to implicate, especially in California, because there's such a, a a robust community college system but the the difference between community colleges and um universities because community colleges don't have the the research burden on uh and i i'm obviously speaking from experience because i'm uh, look at it all right um and so the uh the one of the things that a lot of reports we get is about how students like actually talking with uh in with real instructors rather than grad students and class sizes and how the uh, the burden of, of research and publishing more than the research even um really helps keep the focus on sort of uh, uh, students and what their experience is like through their pathway through okay um was that one of the prelim rounds yeah, that was a prelim round. Okay. Do you know what the quarters? Were? Oh, that was we had partial quarters, right? Oh no, partial octaves. Partial octaves. Right. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not super sure what the other topics were. Okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't able to find the documents. Um, oh, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, I did actually. There was one other one that I remember. Okay. What um, do we got? It was uh, that the Supreme Court of the United States should rule for Net Choice LLC in Net Choice LLC versus Paxton. Um, okay. I believe this is a Section 230 topic. Oh, um, okay. Section 230 uh, is about um, the liability that like social media and like other internet platforms have for like hate speech or uh, crimes that are potentially facilitated through their platforms. Okay. Um, this topic usually comes down to uh, whether or not, usually on the affirmative comes down to uh, how would this plan affect companies taking initiative to um, moderate hate speech better as well as other media um, that goes largely unmoderated currently. This is usually answered on the negative with an economics argument, arguing mm -hmm. that this will scare investors within the media and technology sector, which will crash the economy. So net choice is what you said is the name of the plaintiff. So ruling in favor of net choice would increase the requirements on moderation? make it more stringent or uh, like I'm, I'm just making sure i get the the story straight about um how that because this is it's not necessarily a policy it's more of a ruling which you could like obviously there's analogies to rulings and policies but if we're just saying that the ruling is like you kind of have to know about the details of the 
the court case a little bit. I bet you anything people like look it up real quick and then, they, you know, they, they're like, OK, I, I don't know which side is which. Um, let's see here. Yeah. So um, I believe that ruling on the half of on behalf of net choice would increase the amount of liability that um, oh, okay. social media platforms have. OK. OK. I mean, one way or another. Yeah, it would. It would. OK. Interesting. Yeah, and right yeah. now that, that is the that is right. the direction it would go. Uh, okay. I don't know that it actually directly implicates Section two hundred and thirty, but it is a similar law to Section two hundred and thirty. It might. I'm not sure. Um, I didn't prep any teams on this round, so I'm not one hundred percent sure. Right. But. I and like when when I was doing it, like the um, when I was competing, uh, we, we're still just using like our extemp files for all of our research and everything like that you know we're, we're, we're using like stuff that we uh cut out of actual magazines and newspapers and printed out and everything like that They're, like wi-fi was hardly available anywhere um and like the idea of having a smartphone with all that stuff on it was wildly um out of people's reach as far as like what, what you could do so the idea of having a specific Supreme Court case as a topic seemed pretty rare. Um, is mm. that more common now than 20 years ago? Yeah, certainly. It's certainly more common. It's kind of up to the tournament director's preferences. Okay. I think some tournament directors like it more than others. Um, and I think that Rice typically will have either like a specific bill or a specific Supreme Court case from my recollection. Oh, um, like for, for all of their topics to some degree? Not, not for all of their topics, but they'll usually have at least one topic that is a Supreme Court case. or Oh, is oh at, least, at least one, at least one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, yeah, it's pretty common. Okay. Now, were there any uh, general, so beyond topics, were there any did anybody make waves for any other reason? What I'm saying is, like, were there any strategies that people sort of unveiled and uh, were talked about in in circles around the tournament? Um, was anybody bring up something that was creative or unique or just interesting? Um, I don't believe so. Oh, really? <laughs> I, th I don't think that there were too many arguments that were really new that were surprising a lot of teams, especially the teams that went deep at this tournament. So um, Berkeley's sort of Marxist, cultist thing like that. They've is had that, it for a while. They've had it for a while and they've used it for a while. Yeah, I would I would say my main takeaways, and I think this is very significant about this tournament, is that this is the second year in a row that Whitman has closed out this tournament. Um, oh, it's oh, really? Pretty wow. rare. I think to win the same tournament two years in a row, and it's even more rare to close out the same tournament two years in a row. I wow. think this is a great sign for Whitman. I would say last year after they closed out Rice, they lost a little bit of steam going mm. through the rest of the season, and they didn't perform as well at Nationals as they did at the beginning of the year. Um We'll see if that happens again. I hope it doesn't. Um, there, I've judged both these teams that closed out, and they are wonderful debaters. Um, very pleasant to have in round, mm. and I think that it shows that once again they've put in a lot of work over the summer to try to get better at debate. And we'll see if they can keep this momentum rolling into the next couple tournaments. Uh, a special sort of accolades for Molten and Lou, though, right? Weren't they the only undefeated team? Yes, I they were the only undefeated team, and they did not drop around, obviously, in Elims. Uh, it was between uh, Molten and Lou and Berkeley for that final fifth prelim, and they were able to beat Berkeley uh, in the prelim, which um, is a pretty good accomplishment to give yeah. the former national champions, the reigning national champions, their first loss of the season. Absolutely. All right. And um, okay. And then, and then MG, the other team was also able to uh, edge them out in semis. Okay. So that, that is amazing. Whitman is a team to look out for as far as um, elite levels of uh, parliamentary debate and PDA tournament. Uh, last thing, what's what? Do, what would you say is the next big tournament to look out for um, the in, in the NPDA realm? 
Oh, it's definitely the Steve Hunt. Uh, it's the Steve Hunt Invitational in Lewis and Clark College up in uh, Portland, Oregon. That is the weekend of the 13th through the 15th. Okay. Whitman is will be there. Berkeley will be there. Uh, San Diego State will be there. Okay, there we go. As of right now, I do not know who else will be there because they are running it through Speechwire, uh, which looks okay. like it was developed in 1995. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we got Tab Room, we got Speechwire, we got ForensicsTournament.net. Those would, would you say those are the, the big sort of tournament administrators? Um, yeah, the there used to be there used to be a specific site called Parley Tournament, but that no longer works. But Parley Tournament, if you ever used it, that was secretly the best one. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, excellent. Hey, uh, Gabe, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of insight and in the uh, sort of discussions and that happen behind the scenes at NPDA tournaments, um, or even just people that are generally associated with them. Um, we're definitely going to cover the Steve Hunt uh, uh, recap in a couple of weeks. All right. So I look forward to that. All right. We'll see you later, everyone.